So uh, let's start. We are very happy today to have uh, Wilhelm uh, Berger visiting us from Munich, and he's going to tell us about super solids with ultra cold gases. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot for the invitation uh, to be here and uh, give a talk, which of course, unfortunately, sort of probably <laughs> uh, is uh, changing your schedule for today, but it was sort of announced very recently, but I hope it was. It is interesting and uh, what I will be talking about is uh, a subject that has been sort of very active in the recent years with, in ultra cold gases, namely so called super solids. As you will see, these are, of course, not real solids. Essentially, they are density waves in a gas, but they have uh, quite a, number, a number of features uh, in common with the super solids that have been speculated about a long time ago. Now, to set the stage, I want to start with some sort of rather basic things. Uh, Yeah, they should put screen. a mic on you because of the oh, okay. here. Just click in the screen and it should work. I got to play in the screen. Okay, try it now. Okay, there we go. So I start with some, in a way, general uh, remarks, which, I mean, arguments which go back to Tony Leggett a long time ago. Namely, he argued that, I mean, if you take a system of bosons with some short range interactions and ask, I mean, what is the ground state? Then he gave an argument that says that, I mean, whatever the interact strength of interactions are, if they do not lead to a broken translation invariance and there's no breaking of time reversal symmetry, so the Hamiltonian is real, and not only self retroid then the ground state will always be a BEC and will be superfluid. That's it. I mean, this is not this not a proof, but that's the, the argument is reasonably uh, sort of uh, convincing. Uh, but it is in detail a non-trivial argument, which is based on looking at, I mean, what's happening if you take particles around the ring in a geometry uh, where you sort of put the flux sort of through the center of the ring. And one crucial ingredient in the argument is, of course, that, I mean, what you can do for a system of bosons in the absence of a breaking of time reversal invariance, you can choose your ground state wave function to be positive everywhere. That's a crucial argument, and this goes back, of course, to Feynman. It is important to note, of course, that, I mean, this argument breaks down immediately if you break time reversal invariance. If you have a strong magnetic field, you go to the lowest lambda level, uh, then uh, and choose a filling factor of one half. Then for bosons with strong short range repulsion, of course, you can, the one it is expected to have a wave function which is closer to the Laughlin wave function for filling one half. And that system has a nice uniform density. So translation invariance is, is, is not broken spontaneously, but of course it's far from a, a superfluid. It's, it's, it's a mod insulated, it has a gap. So the assumption of uh, no not breaking uh, time reversal invariance is crucial. Now, uh, wait, so if you have a, this ions, so oh. very, very strong repulsive interaction, you can still say in the box is a uniform system, the translation invariant, but they would not. No, but, 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 but ions then, I mean, for a charge system, then, I mean, I would not, I mean, this is short range interaction. So basically, I mean, of course, the type of interactions I have in mind are the usual type that have some short range repulsion. There's okay. some scale sigma and there's some maybe, I mean, on the virus type or short range interaction. So, I mean, for neutral system of particles, for this kind of interactions, the argument is okay, whatever you do, as long as it doesn't sort of break uh, spontaneously the translation invariance and you, there's no magnetic field or something like that, that, that your wave function is real, then you're always, so in a way, BC and superfluidity is something extremely generic. That's what this uh, okay. uh, argument tells you. Uh, does this wave function violate this Feynman uh, assumption or Feynman condition? You mean the the the, the Laughlin one? It has zero. Yeah, it's complex. Well, it has zeros, but I mean that's I mean okay, it has quadratic zeros at coincident points, but the major point it's complex. And 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 so the the point is of course uh, uh, 
the, the, the real, I mean, to, to, to say, I mean, something is positive, of course, only makes sense if you uh, have a, uh, so, and, and that's uh, a crucial uh, ingredient. Okay, so if you have a wave function, a grounded wave function, which is everywhere real and positive, then you might come to the idea and say, ah, maybe I can represent it as the square root of a classical probability distribution, uh, which uh, for a classical system of particles and particles, uh, and which, I mean, we know in equilibrium can be written as a Boltzmann uh, weight where we have some effective potential depending uh, on the positions of the particles. Uh, of course, I assume translation invariance. So this interaction V tilde, which is the interaction divided by some effective temperature of this classical system, uh, only must obey sort of that things are translation invariance. I do not assume that this is a sum of two body interactions that would lead to the so-called Chaucer wave functions. I, that's not a necessary assumption. What I assume, however, is that it's translation invariant. And in a way, I can, of course, you, uh, it should be sort of, in a way, still uh, short range, but it might not be sort of the original interaction of, this, uh, of, the, of the quantum system. And the normalization of the wave function is then provided by this configuration integral. This idea of, in a way, representing many body wave functions in terms of the square root of some classical probability distribution goes back also to Feynman. And it was then used in an influential paper by Onzaga and Penrose in uh, the mid 50s. And uh, what I will show is that this uh, uh, representation is, I mean, quite useful, but you have to be very cautious with it. And it's, it, it can lead to sort of uh, 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 dangerous results. Now, if you assume that holds, what you can calculate is the one particle density matrix U put a particle in here and take it out back there on the quantum mechanical level. Here in this classical representation, this one particle density matrix essentially can be written in terms of a ratio of two expectation values in an N minus one particle state for a classical system now, where in the denominator, you just add one particle. And since it's translation invariance, it doesn't matter where I do it. In the numerator, I need to add two particles here and here, x and x prime. Uh, so this is a two particle interaction. And the difference with respect to the lower one where this V tilde is just of the change inter in total interaction energy by adding one particle is now the total change in interaction energy by adding the two particles. And now it depends on positions. But these two guys, which are added here, they, they do not interact among themselves, but they interact with the strength of the rest only with their half, with half of the strength. Because of, you see, if I sort of put these two guys together, then I get sort of the, the local density, and then this thing cancels out and you get one. It's just a uniform density. Now, the crucial point is now with this argument is the following, that you say, if I have a classical fluid, I add two particles at widely separated points, that separates, that, that factorizes for short range interactions in a classical system. And so in the end, I mean, for, if you look at the one particle density matrix at large distances, you can express this as a ratio of uh, uh, two expectation values here, adding one particle with half the strength squared and in the denominator adding one particle uh, with the full interaction strength. And then what you see is that from this type of argument, you get sort of a cheap kind of proof or argument for the old legged argument that every uh, ground state of a homogeneous Bose system is a superfluid because it has off diagonal long range order. So that sounds very nice and it becomes even more nice if you do what Onsaga and Penrose did in 56, namely to say, well, let's assume to, in order to describe at that time, sort of the only superfluid was a superfluid that was known was helium-4, but helium-4 was a strong interacting system. People didn't know how to really sort of cope with that. But what <clears throat> Onsag and Pendro said is, let's assume that I can model sort of this system as essentially a hard sphere system. We roughly know what the scale of the short distance repulsion is in this system, two and a half angstrom, and we know what the density of the system is. 
And if we map this to a heart sphere system, to a classical heart sphere system, classical heart sphere systems have been studied quite well already in the 50s. And so, what, uh, and of course, for classical heart sphere, for heart spheres, half of the interaction is the same as the full interaction because it's either zero or infinity. Uh, and so, then, I mean, the, uh, if you go back to the, to the ratio here, I mean, this, the, the uh, numerator, becomes sort of uh, just the square of the denominator, and uh, you get a result that the condensate fraction in helium-4 is just the average of, in a, in a classical hard sphere gas, you add a particle and you have to calculate the, the, the thermodynamic average. And that, I mean, classical hard sphere system have been studied. People did know the equation of state of that system. You need the, this is the excess chemical potential. It's actually an example of the Yarchinsky inequality uh, uh, much before Yachinsky, that's precisely that. The exponent, the average of the exponential of the work to add a particle is equal to e to the minus the additional chemical potential. Uh, and that was known. And then you, you know the density of helium, and then they predicted, ah, okay, that was a okay. Helium is a BC, and it has a condensate fraction on a, less, a bit less than 10%. Well, wow. fantastic. In 56, without much to do. Well, Great, but it is fortuitous. And that was pointed out to me by Nozier a long time ago. Uh, Nozier, then I asked Nozier about whether this is known. He said, no, no, but I'll, I'll eventually write a book. And so, but he didn't. <laughs> so uh, uh, what, what's wrong? Well, go to low densities. I mean, now we are more interested in the low density regime. Go to low densities. What this argument will tell you is that the condensate fraction deviates from one, the, the ideal Bose gas, by a term which is linear in the density. And that's kind of a second period coefficient that you can show this is uh, uh, almost positive. So there's, it goes linear in density. That contradicts Bogolyubov. 47, because Bogolyubov told us, uh, I mean, in a dilute uh, leaking graphing, uh, for the gas, the condensate density deviates from one by square root and a cubed. And actually, it is only, this was 47, the prediction, and it is only in the textbooks, the actually experimental proof that this is one. Uh, 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 verification of that formula, including sort of the prefactor, was done in the group of Soran Hatsibavich a few years ago. Uh, by essentially exploiting a Feshbach resonance in potassium 39, and then actually changing in these uh, extremely dilute gases, uh, the condensate fraction uh, going from whatever 99.9% to about 90%. And over that range, you can sort of verify uh, the Bogolyubov prediction uh, 70 years after uh, sort of Bogolyubov had found that. So that's nice. And so definitely the uh, story with representing the many body state as a square root of a classical probability distribution doesn't work. So where does it go wrong? Well, I think the major point is it doesn't get the, the long distance behavior right. Namely, if you have a quantum system in the ground state, it's a compressible quantum system, uh, then you know uh, the static structure factor, which tells you about the pair distribution function, has to vanish at small momenta like Q times some psi over square root two. In the Bogolyubov theory, you get precisely sort of this behavior, but that's completely general. But if you have a classical system, a classical system has some sort of, in a way, number fluctuations, even sort of, if you wish, at zero temperature. And so this is, is finite. And you would need to add a one over R squared interactions, repulsive one over R squared interactions to get a static structure factor which vanishes. But one of our squared interactions are not, they're not, they make no thermodynamic sense. I mean, they are too long ranged to, to make thermodynamic sense. So, in a way, what I claim is that, I mean, the, uh, of course, Pendros Onsaga is, is a fantastic paper. I'm not criticizing that paper in, in, in fully, but I mean, this point, in a way, one has to say was completely fortuitous. Uh, and so, in a way, compressible states, you can you cannot do this. One has to be very cautious with such an argument. Now, uh, of course, so we still believe Leggett's arguments that, in a way, whenever the system is uh, 
uh, fluid, either gas or liquid, uh, you get a superfluid ground state. The question is what decides whether you are fluid uh, or liquid or gases, that's essentially the strength of the zero point uh, uh, energy uh, measured, it's in, for instance, by the Stipur parameter, uh, just in a way the zero point energy on the scale sigma divided uh, by uh, the depth of this potential here. And for typical systems is, of course, this is this uh, the poor parameter is much less than one. Uh, and it has been studied already in the 70s uh, by Nosanov, Miller, and others that you, in order to get a liquid state, basically this potential has to be sort of shallow enough to have at the, on the order of one ground state, perhaps, or, or no one. Otherwise, you don't get a liquid ground state. And there's, in a way, a relatively narrow regime of the poor parameters where you get a liquid phase diagram like the one in helium-4. Helium-4 has a degree parameter 0.42. And, but you get a liquid in the sense that, of course, it has a finite density at zero pressure. But you also see the density, the correct density is set by the short distance repulsion. Uh, while you get a gas only if the Debour parameter is larger than around 0.68 or something like that. And the only system in nature that really realizes that as an equilibrium configuration would be spin polarized hydrogen that has been Bose condensed uh, uh, in 1988 by Kleppner uh, and Greytag at MIT. Of course, I mean, now we are uh, in a way this type of phase diagram is in a way, the base diagram we are looking in uh, all the day with cold gases. Of course, cold gases are not in this class. Uh, they have the poor parameters, I mean, rubidium or, or sodium or so, the poor parameters which are much less than one. But if you are at low enough densities, basically all these bound states uh, here uh, are, are irrelevant and we can, in a way, concentrate only on the continuum states. Uh, and uh, then you get a behavior. Uh, as long as the scattering length is positive. So it's actually an interesting point that basically already in, in the 60s, Lieb has pointed out that a sufficient condition for a gaseous ground state for bosons is to have positive scattering length and no bound state. And the answer is this is also sufficient and necessary. Uh -huh. so it's, it's both sufficient and necessary. Uh, and helium-4 has one bound state, but just one. And, but if, if you go a bit further, then, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the liquid phase is gone. The, how are you distinguishing? Is there an order parameter to distinguish gas superfluid from? No, there's no order parameter. There's no, I mean, of course, liquid and gas are just uh, distinguished by sort of the behavior. But in a way, the, the, the crucial uh, point is that for a gases, uh, if I let the pressure go to zero, then the density goes to zero. So that's 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 in a way. So it's in a way it's it's in the in the in the form of the equation of state, if you wish. That's just sort of I'm telling you. I mean, for the cold gases, uh, you need to confine them, uh, or for the liquids, you don't. So that's all. But in a way, there's no symmetry problem, of course. But it's 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 a it's of course. Uh, Yes. And now, of course, uh, Son and uh, Mr. Stefanov, I mean, to, to how to go from here to there is a non-trivial problem that was worked out in detail uh, by you. And I will not, of course, uh, uh, go on uh, with, with this because this is by now well known, although it's a, a quite non-trivial story. It's not, uh, it wasn't, I mean, I, I originally, when I wrote this paper, I thought, okay, I mean, uh, in, in all this regime, up there, it would be uh, sort of uh, helium four like. That's not true, as you found out very nicely. So, uh, once you go beyond one bound state, then so, so it, once you go beyond one bound state, then the, the ground state would be like that is solid. Or? No, not yet. I mean, yeah. that's so it's, a, it's an interesting question. So, if you see, I mean, helium four has almost infinite scattering length. It, you know that the two body bound state in helium yeah, four. Yeah is 10 to the minus four times this epsilon. It's, it's incredibly weakly bound. The scattering length is bound. It's not infinite, but the, I mean, it, it's, you can say helium-4 is a unitary Bose gas, yes. but or very close to a unitary Bose gas. But of course, it is dominated. It, 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 it's not scale invariant because, of course, unless you, if you throw away the sigma, then 
then things are, uh, collapse. We know that's the problem. So in a way, it's, it's a near unitary ghost gas, but not scaling there because the sigma has to be kept there. And the density, you see, the density is is, is determined by sigma. <clears throat> But you had some question. No, but isn't it just also due to the ephemeral effect? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's another, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the sigma. That, the, yes, that's effect. true. Yeah, no, I, okay. the ephemeral effect of all course also. So now, I mean, if we, if I had made now this argument that basically whenever you have short range interactions, mm -hmm. as long as it's fluid, you always have the BEC, then you can sort of in a way be even more bold and say, maybe we could retain the BEC in long range order, even in a solid phase. Maybe uh, even that uh, might, might be possible. And that question uh, has been asked to my knowledge first in this paper by Penrose and Onsaga in 56, and they immediately dismissed it. They said, well, I mean, in order to have a uh, long range off diagonal, long range order, long range phase coherence in, in a solid, you would need to have delocalized particles. But in a solid, there are no delocalized particles. The only stuff that is delocalized would be sort of some interstitials, uh, some vacancies, but they are frozen out at zero temperature. And so they immediately dismissed it. Uh, there's a short paragraph in the paper. Now, well, it has a long history, but sort of, I mean, the story about this, uh, I mean, was taken up by Andreev and Lifshitz in particular in 69. They said, well, no, no, uh, we could imagine perhaps a solid, which is a, an incommensurate solid. So the number of atoms uh, of particles and the number of lattice sites is, is different. So it either has intrinsically at zero temperature interstitials or vacancies. And of course, then you can sort of innovate intuitively imagine, okay, if I look at sort of this hole, this hole could in a, in a quantum crystal wander around and be, and I have a finite density of these holes that could wander around and sort of in a way form a BC. And so they said, well, I mean, it, it's, not, it, it's not excluded. They speculated that maybe helium-4 might have something like this, but in particular, what they predicted also, and that's important is that they said, well, if such a situation occurs, then it would lead to something completely new, namely a new mode. Well, you have an additional broker symmetry. Uh, namely, usually if you have defects in a solid, they propagate, uh, they diffuse. But then if you have such a super solid, then the diffuse, diffusive motion of the defects would be replaced by ballistic propagation. So you get a new type of sound type mode, uh, which has a dispersion linear in Q, like like uh, a standard sound mode, beyond sort of the usual sound mode of a of a sound. Now, Tony Leggett came uh, a year later and said, "Well, it's fine, but you say uh, it's not. Uh, it's probably hard to observe." At that time, mostly helium, solid helium, was uh, thought about, because what Tony Leggett found is that the superfluid fraction which for a uniform uh, superfluid is one at zero temperature, will not be one, which will be less than one if you have a modulation in density. And in particular, if you have a strong modulation in density, uh, like the one indicated schematically here, uh, where sort of there's basically very little one particle density in between sort of the lattice sites, if you wish, then the superfluid fraction would be very small the inequality, the inequality I give here is not the one legged wrote down, but it's qualitative. It gives you the, the correct behavior. And then you just define the visibility n max minus and min divided by the sum. If you have a situation like this, this, this uh, figure has a visibility close to one, exponentially close to one. And therefore you see the superfluid fraction would be super tiny. Uh, and, and so Tony Leggett actually at that time estimated that in helium four, uh, the superfluid fraction, even if it was uh, of, of this, uh, uh, if, if you had some interstitials or vacancies in the ground state, would be less than 10 to the minus four. And they said, well, we'll probably not see it. Mm -hmm. And in a way, in hindsight, one can say he was right. <laughs> uh, in 70, of course, the, may some of you may, may know that, I mean, in 2005, there were uh, speculations uh -huh observations of some super solidity in helium-4, but in the end that in a way disappeared because it was not an intrinsic effect. And so I think the, the, the result that in helium-4 there is no super solid uh, region, I think is pretty clear now. But of course, what 
the delegate argument also tells you is that in a way to look for a super solid, of course, the nice thing is not to really think about a, a hard solid, but to say, well, let's try to go to a situation where we have some sort of slight small density modulation uh, in, a, in a uniform uh, superfluid. Then, I mean, that bound tells you that, okay, if the density modulation is small, uh, that, that superfluid fraction uh, could be sort of of order one as we have in uniform systems. That's, that was sort of in a way, uh, one of uh, the lessons of, 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 this, uh, of this paper. Uh, okay, uh, now. I have a question. Yeah. The, the statement about commensurate, so what should be commensurate with? Uh, or uh, okay. So it's, it's the, the com commensurate uh, just means that sort of the, the number of particles and number of lattice sites is, 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 is the ratio is an integer. I'll just take, well, equal number of particles. So lattice sites, lattice. you mean the, of the spontaneous solid? Oh, of the, of the, and, and, the, and the argument is that, I mean, well, the, that was Andreev and Lifshitz's argument, uh, basically, you need an incommensurate situation. So you basically you need vacancies or interstitials to have any superfluidity. Actually, it is one one can find. Okay, I, we could discuss later on. I mean, you can find exceptional situations where even at in a way in a commensurate situation, uh, you you can allow that. I mean, see, even if sort of I mean, you have you have this picture here where, where this guy sits on his right place, but I mean, sitting on the right place for a quantum particle doesn't make sense. You mean you see? I mean, if you have a, a Bose crystal with it, with a lot of exchange uh, stuff going uh, tunneling around, I mean, it's not in inconceivable that I mean, even that such a system which is commensurate shows super solidity. That's not excluded. It's not the generic situation. It can happen. And in a way, it happens in a somehow trivial manner at integer density uh, in the superfluid regime of the Bose Hubbard model. But that, in a way, is of course not a good, perfectly, or not a really a good example because then, then the density modulation is put in externally. Here, of course, I'm, I'm talking about systems where sort of density is, uh, uh, invariance is spontaneously broken, not externally. Okay. Um, Okay. Uh, now the question is: I mean, can one go to situations where sort of a small density modulation appears in in in, in cold gases? And the answer is: well, this is uh, in a way brings me to the uh, to the dipolar gases. You can do if you have sort of strong dipolar interactions. Dipolar gases have been around uh, since two thousand five, originally with chromium, uh, but in a way the game changer was the. Uh, in a way, realization that you can also Bose condense uh, the rare earth uh, atoms, erbium and dysprosium. And for these rare earth atoms, they have a much larger dipole moment, 10 mu bor, they have a larger mass, and that helps a lot actually sort of to make the, uh, the, the, the interaction, dipole interactions much stronger. Now, if you look at the dipole interaction, of course, it's the interaction between two particles, a dipole, and all these dipoles are oriented along the same direction. Uh, you multiply the dipole moment uh, with the magnetic field, another dipole at a distance x produces at this position. Then if you go to Fourier uh, space, I mean, the, uh, this, uh, Magnetic field has to be linear in D and has to have zero divergence. So that's in a way the only function you can write down uh, as far as the uh, sort of uh, uh, vector dependence is concerned. And then you see this is essentially uh, always negative. And you also see that, I mean, the modulus of the momentum doesn't appear in this. This is just a trivial consequence of the fact that one of our cubed has the same scaling dimension than the delta function in. Uh, in three dimensions. And so in a way you have, it's like an effective uh, constant interaction in momentum space. So an effective zero range interaction, but with a negative, effectively negative scattering length. And this uh, scattering length is of order uh, dipole moment squared times mass divided by h bar squared. Now it's clear that, I mean, if you have sort of these attractive interactions, I mean, the system, I mean, is on the verge of its stability because I mean, if these guys arrange head to tail, then I mean, well, they will collapse and then some short distance physics comes in that you want to avoid. And so for a homogeneous dipolar gas, you essentially need to add a scattering, a, a short range interaction to make it stable <laughs> that is larger than sort of this dipolar length. You can improve 
on a situation by sort of in a way now changing the geometry, if you sort of go to a pancake geometry, uh, sort of where the, the pancake is wide in the direction perpendicular to the dipoles, then uh, you uh, can stabilize the system uh, in a regime uh, even beyond sort of this uh, dimensionless strength of the dipolar interaction, uh, which is the ratio of this dipolar uh, length divided by the short range scattering length. And this uh, parameter uh, is on the order of say one, one or 1.5 or so into, in, in these diprosium and erbium gases. And that in a way it was 0.1 or 0.15 in chromium there these dipole interactions were uh, uh, relatively small effects and you also see it the dipole interaction is so long ranged it's one of r cubed one of r cubed is so long ranged that your thermodynamics in a way depends on sort of the, the geometry wow. usually we are not used to that i mean we usually think that i mean we write down an equation of state and we, we don't care about the boundary conditions we shouldn't care well that's only true if you if the interactions decay uh, more fast than one of r to the dimensions so of one of r to the cube, uh, cubed two dimensions. Okay, so uh, so two things that happen. One that I men mentioned first is that you can actually get liquids, a liquid droplet that was observed in a way by chance in configurations where sort of you have sort of some uh, spheroidal configuration where uh, in a way the uh, probability of uh, being head to tail was a bit larger perhaps than sort of side by side. And then uh, in the group of Tilman Pfau uh, in uh, 2016, they observed in the gas of dysprosium that uh, such a gas, if you expand it, uh, usually if you, uh, if you take the trapping away in a gas, well, the, the, just, the, the stuff just disappears. <laughs> this didn't. <laughs> For, for, for a while, this sort of uh, uh, expanded in a series of droplets here. So these are very tiny self-bound droplets um, on the edge of the order of 800 or 1,000 particles. It's very, still a very small system. The total number of particles is uh, 10,000 or 20,000. It's very small. But clearly, you have self-bound <laughs> droplets at a density that turns out to be about 100 times larger than the density of usual bees, gases, BECs, but still only 10 to the minus four of the density here in the air. I mean, it's incredible that, I mean, you have liquids now that, I mean, are 10 to the minus four, the density of air, but they're self-bound in the sense that, okay, the, the pressure, uh, the density in, in the zero pressure limit, you, you wouldn't have to confine them. Uh, but the question is, I mean, what stabilizes them? And that's something that is really quite, uh, uh, remarkable. It, they're, it, they're not stabilized by some sort of uh, short range repulsion. It's essentially sort of zero point fluctuations. You have to check if you go and make a description of a BC in terms of uh, Bogolubov theory, you know there's Bogolubov excitations and there's a zero point energy associated with the Bogolubov excitations. That zero point energy is actually the reason for the so called LHY corrections. So in a way, physically, it's just a zero point energy of the Bogolubov excitations. And if you calculate this for the homogeneous gas, you get a contribution to the compressibility, which goes like uh, the square root of Na cubed, and it's sort of positive. So that allows you to stabilize a gas. One should, however, add right here, and I will perhaps mention it again at the end. The story is not completely, so and the estimate you get for the density then is, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, correct, it stabilizes this instability here where sort of the epsilon of D, D, D becomes larger than one. This F of kappa is depending a bit on, or depends on this anisotropy of the, of the strap configuration. Uh, so it's close to one. Uh, but the problem is that, I mean, this the, for LHY corrections are calculated for a uniform 3D gas. In the uniform 3D gas, actually in the regime where you are in, namely where this uh, strength of the dipole interactions is larger than one, actually become complex. And people just discard the imaginary part. And the complexity, the, the fact that it's complex is just a, a matter of fact that, I mean, the effective, uh, let me write down the effective uh, interaction uh, with the dipoles is uh, It's just the usual short range interaction and then you get one plus epsilon dd, uh, and then you get it. 
So that's the usual short range stuff, uh, interactions constant. We add the bipolar interactions. I told you that, I mean, it's also in a way essentially independent of mod Q, but it has this <laughs> angular dependence. Uh, this is the dimensional strength. But you see, I mean, you, you get the problem. I mean, if this if the cosine here is uh, zero, then you have the minus uh, one here. And so, I mean, if epsilon dd is larger than one, so this it can become negative. And then you're expanding around something that is actually not well defined. But okay, that's, that, that's in a way for the moment, ignore this uh, and go sort of to another type of instability, which now occurs. And that's sort of in the way this uh, in the density wave instability, let's squeeze them to a, a pancake configuration by uh, going to, I mean, uh, combining the atoms in, in the plane uh, uh, perpendicular to the uh, orientation of the dipoles. Then at large distances, you get the purely repulsive interactions. At, uh, and you get the Fourier transform is just uh, minus mod Q. And then you have, of course, this system you have to, uh, to stabilize. You have to add some constant short range interaction uh, to, to get, uh, of course, a stable system. But what you see here in this system, what you can have is that the uh, potential defective interaction potential in the uh, lowest transfer state of this uh, pancake uh, becomes negative in uh, in a range where sort of Q times LC is of order one. So this tells you there might be an instability that is set not by, uh, is set by the external confinement length and not by some sort of intrinsic interactions. And that uh, is, I mean, has been realized early on that such a system shows something which is similar to the rotor in helium uh, four and actually exhibits a peak in the static structure factor. And the peak occurs typically in this regime where the uh, dipolar interaction strength is of order one in the regime where Q times LC is of order one. So basically such a system is uh, has a density wave instability uh, where the length, the, the, the wave vector is set by the external confinement length. And that um, so if I follow Bokolupov, Bokolupov so, equation would predict what would... Well, okay. Uh, now the, 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 the point is the following. That, I mean, here, this is just Bokolupov uh, uh, theory with this type of interaction. Uh, in, in the homogeneous, uh, well, in, the, in, in, this, in this situation where you have a, a homogeneous uh, configuration in two dimensions, but... Uh, in the, in the lowest transverse level in the, along the C direction. What you will get is then, of course, that eventually if you crack the strength of this interaction here, then uh, the Bogolyov theory will tell you, these are the epsilon Qs, the Bogolyov the theory tells you that, I mean, this goes down. And once you are beyond this point, uh, then uh, you know it, it, you you cannot uh, you cannot go further. Actually, what I think, or what, what is I actually also seen, is that the instability appears before. So I mean, the naive expectation that in order to have a density wave instability, you need the volume of excitations to really go to zero doesn't happen. It's a it's a it's preempted. There's a first order transition and. Uh, so we had some arguments, but this is also only qualitative. This is why I also uh, indicated the static structure field here. In the theory of fluids, it's known that basically a fluids crystallize when the peak, the dominant peak of the static structure factor exceeds a value of order one. That's called the Hansen, it was known in classical fluids, it's called the hansen Berlet criterion. And there's actually also in quantum fluids, something like this happens, but not, I mean, people have never tested this for such a dipolar interaction. You, you wanted, so, so this is, uh, so yeah, okay. So on the experimental side, now I, I just see, I mean, the theory here is, 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 is uh, far from uh, sort of complete. Uh, experimentally, you see this uh, in, in different groups have seen this. Uh, one essentially cannot change, one can change this parameter, not by changing the dipole interactions, but by changing the short range scattering length, which you, you use uh, Feshbach resonance. Uh, and so basically the uh, epsilon dd was 
that polar length divided by the short range scattering length. You keep this fixed, but you decrease this. Uh, and then you increase the strength, uh, uh, strength of the dipolar interactions. And what is seen here for such uh, BCs in cigar shape traps is that you essentially, uh, by reducing the short range interaction, you form a, uh, in a way, uh, density wave along the weak axial direction with a wave vector set by the uh, AC. And then eventually sort of this becomes, I mean, this density wave is then really eventually becoming not only just a weak modulation, but it's really very strong. And so this, uh, these drop, with some sort of reasonably homogeneous droplets, so separate in a, in a, in a series of completely isolated things. Uh, and from sort of measurements in situ density measurements, you can actually also uh, determine the static structure factor. And you see something happening uh, in the static structure factor, which looks like what you expect in Bogolyov, that there's a peak showing up. It actually of the peak also uh, changes in, uh, in, in position. And uh, if you make a single mode approximation and extract the effective excitation energy from just uh, the uh, this uh, measuring the static structure factor, what you will find is that the effective excitation energy in a very rough way uh, for big dipolar interactions uh, well, shows some small indication of a roton minimum. Then there's the roton minimum shift, or the minimum shifts a bit. And eventually at this point, so this is the lowest uh, scattering length plotted here. At this point, actually, you, you really get this density wave. And so, uh, uh, if you look at the scales here, the scales are tremendously small. I mean, the, the roton gap is 20 hertz. Uh, this is one nano Kelvin. This is 10 to the uh, minus seven of the roton gap in helium four. Helium four has a roton gap of uh, nine Kelvin or something like that. Uh, and the, uh, this is the thing. Now, the question is, what uh, uh, can one sort of on the, on the theory side, I will not be able to, I mean, I'm a theorist, and so I should not sort of, in a way, of course, these are nice experiments, but uh, in the end, um, we want to do some theory here. Uh, the question is, what, what can you do? I think the description of these transitions, both the gas-liquid transition and the transition to these density waves is, is not, I mean, people will use what is called the extended cross description, but what I mentioned is one is using that in a regime where actually uh, this, is, is not really a well-defined story because basically you neglect the fact that in a way you are beyond the regime that the roton has dived down to zero and you just throw out the measuring part. And I, I personally find it very unsettled and satisfactory. But of course, in the, unless you have something better, it's hard to, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to do anything. What I can do is I can say, well, something like going back to Andrea Lifshitz and can say, I mean, can one, say something about in a way a new uh, mode which comes from sort of a spontaneous broken translation symmetry and for this and this is some stuff i worked on uh, relatively recently together with uh, johannes hoffmann in Göteborg, is we said okay if we look at these uh, uh, experimental uh, figures here along uh, so sort of the, the x of direction this looks like a, a series of stripes, and it's a bit like a liquid crystal that has been known in classical liquids for a long time ago, a so-called smectic A phase. In a smectic A phase, you have a classical liquid which has a layered structure. There's a certain layering uh, wave vector, uh, and, and there's a density modulation uh, by, on this layering wave vector. And the question is, can one do something about, in a way, the hydrodynamic modes uh, of this, of such layered structures, not in the classical regime, but sort of for quantum fluids. And so if you describe these layer structures in terms of the average density, then the average density is, of course has non-trivial Fourier modes at this wave vector Q0 of the ordering, which I mentioned is set in this cold gases by the transverse confining length. And if we want to uh, describe density fluctuations, basically you add a phase here, which sort of shifts this layered, uh, this uh, fixed structure uh, with, with some small modulations. Actually, this so-called layer phase variable U was introduced by Dijen a uh, long time ago in the context of describing 
uh, well, uh, hydrodynamics of classically liquid uh, crystals. And now in this, in such a phase, you can, it's, it's important to realize that you have sort of, in a way, two ways of changing density. You can change the density by saying, I just change my lattice constant. That's what you do in a normal solid. Then, and that gives rise to a, a lattice, uh, to the density fluctuation, which is average density times the divergence of the displacement field. But you can also change densities by saying, well, I keep my, uh, my lattice uh, completely fixed, but I shuffle particles from one uh, sort of uh, uh, side to the, uh, from one, <clears throat> one of the stripe to the, to the next stripe. That's also, and in a classical smectic fluid, that's a diffusive process. That mode has actually a name, it's called the permeation mode in, in classical uh, uh, liquid, uh, classical, uh, uh, liquid crystals. It, it was introduced by Duchesne and these people, Paul Martin, in the, in the, in the, in the early 70s. Uh, and what we will find is that, okay, here this permeation mode is no longer diffuse, it becomes propagating. And the point is that the total density of fluctuations, of course, contain both possibilities. You change the lattice constant or you shuffle uh, particles from, from layer to layer. And you can to do, I mean, if at the level of reversible thermodynamics, it is, uh, there's a straightforward procedure how to work it out. You express your entropy density in terms of the conserved variables. Conserved variables in such a 2D situation now would be energy is conserved, particle number is conserved, momentum is conserved. And then you have the two, in a way, broken symmetry variables, this, uh, in a way, layer phase, gradient of the displacement field, and the superfluid velocity. And you uh, have, in a way, two dimensions, four conservation laws. You have two broken symmetry generators. You expect, in a way, altogether six hydrodynamic modes. And two of them uh, turn, will turn out to be sort of Goldstone modes associated with the two broken U1 symmetries. And then there's heat diffusion and shear diffusion. Note that, I mean, if, if it were a uniform uh, superfluid, uh, you would not have heat diffusion. You would have second sound. That's gone here. Uh, instead of this. And so you can work this out in some detail by realizing, okay, what is the conjugate variables to these uh, thermodynamic relations for the superfluidity? We have the superfluid stiffness, the rho s, uh, which comes in and, and in, the, in the superfluid current is then what matters is not just the superfluid velocity, but the superfluid velocity relative uh, to the normal velocity. What's the normal velocity here? Uh, there's a nice paper by uh, Damson a long time ago, and uh, he did it in much more detail here. I'm trivializing it uh, at this uh, linear level. It's just essentially the time derivative of this displacement field. And uh, the smectic order, so there's in a way one uh, stiffness constant with the superfluid order. There's another stiffness constant with the smectic order. This just tells you that if you add, if you have such a density modulation, the system becomes a bit stiffer. That's called the... Uh, uh, was called the layer compression models. That is a parameter which already appeared in classical smectic A liquid crystals. And the crucial point now, as I mentioned is, going back to this negative argument, whenever we have a finite density modulation, then there is a, normal a finite normal fluid density at zero temperature. That allows you to say that if I go to low enough temperatures, the heat variable, which is usually, which is uh, important for the second sound, actually drops out of the problem. And what remains are sort of this momentum uh, and energy and, uh, and sort of innovated two independent density fluctuations. And you get essentially a four by four problem, which you can I mean, relatively easily solve and you get an exact expression for these uh, velocities. So there's in a way in the system, there's a compressional mode. That's sort of the usual compressional modes that you also have, but there's also a new mode, uh, the C2 squared and uh, the expression contains only the uh, compression modulus of, of the system, the total density, this layer compression modulus and the normal fluid density or the supposed fluid fraction. And qualitatively such in, in a way, so you should. Yeah, uh, so the transitions are just broken, broken in one direction? Yes, yes. So in a way they did. Your, your categorization of modes probably depends on the wave vector. Yes, so I'm I'm looking here only at modes which sort of propagate perpendicular to this, uh, uh, to the to the to these layers, 
the story becomes much more intricate if you sort of have uh, wave vectors which uh, go have a finite angle. That has been worked out in a classical smectic uh, story a long time ago um, by Paul Martin and these people and so on. And that was actually, it was, was a nice prediction, which I mean, you look at it, Jackie Lubensky, you find yes. this, this thing that, yeah, okay. Yes, precisely, that's it. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, here we, we just uh, go along because you know, the, uh, one of the things is that, I mean, the, the elastic energy goes like B over two, Time sort of the day uh, so that's the thing we, we calculate. But if you add now, then there is a a one over two, and then you get uh, so you get a q to the fourth behavior for the for the stuff. But okay, no, we just that's not we we're just looking at sort of this, and so this the in a way now. The theory is nice and it's uh, sort of, you can say exact uh, as hydrodynamics is, but you have, of course, to know these parameters. Uh, and you can, I mean, there's no quantitative comparison to experiment, but what you can uh, argue is that, I mean, people have measured, and this is the group of Giovanni Modugno in, uh, in Florence, they have measured sort of the, the breathing mode oscillation. Uh, so that's uh, uh, in, in this in this in this uh, cigar shaped dipolar gases with the density modulations. And what they found is that the breathing mode, which is usually sort of the BC at 1.5 times the three half times sort of the confining frequency, actually at this transition from sort of the reasonably homogeneous system to the supersonic, splits up into two modes or have, shows two modes. The one goes up and you can roughly identify it sort of that with the compression mode and argue that, okay, now if you have this additional layering structure, then the system becomes stiffer a bit and one goes down and eventually sort of disappears uh, when there is no uh, super solidity. So you can roughly identify sort of this behavior with uh, this new sort of defect, proper, uh, ballistic propagation of defects. Actually, there's a recent paper by Sandro Stingari on the archive where he made these things a bit more uh, uh, sort of quantitative at the Grosbytayevsky level for a, uh, and he actually was able to calculate this layer compression modulus and the superfluid fraction uh, within the Grosbytayevsky level as a function of sort of the uh, 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 parameters more uh, uh, in detail, but that's something that in a way well, I mean, basically the structure here is the same as uh, what we had here. So this is in a way that we can say, uh, if, uh, the Andreev Lifshitz uh, type of uh, new defect, proper, def uh, ballistic propagation of defects uh, is seen here. So let me, in the end, I'm sorry, I took, took so long, sorry. sorry. Um, in the end, say, point out a few things that, I mean, are relatively open. I mentioned this already. I mean, in principle, I mean, these, both the liquid and this uh, transition and this transition to the inhomogeneous uh, state, I mean, uh, you need the stabilization by zero point fluctuations, but zero point fluctuations, I mean, uh, in principle, what one needs to calculate is essentially sort of the, uh, at least to lowest order in one loop, a proper, uh, a proper theory for the LHY corrections. And, and but that will not it will not be sufficient. It's not sufficient to do this in the homogeneous system because in the homogeneous system that's ill-defined. You need to take into account that the that the fact that these gases are confined and that due to the long-range nature of the interactions, things will depend on your shapes. That's something that is important and which at the one loop level this has been taken into account in a way, if you wish, at the at the tree level, but not but not at the one loop level. So in a way, that's that's not uh, non trivial. And then I mean mentioned also before. I mean this is this this transition is is not and this hasn't been seen uh, has been seen only indirectly. It's not that the the the, the roton doesn't go to zero. The transition happens at a point where the roton still has a finite gap. And can you do something what I mentioned before that you say you can determine the transition from a critical value of order one of the static structure factor. I'm pretty sure that that's possible, but of course, I mean, how in detail is not so known. And then also, I mean, the transition, which is completely unexplored, that that's, people don't understand that at all, is, I mean, what's happening then eventually if there's a, this density modulation becomes very strong, and then this 
thing develops into a series of independent droplets. I believe it's probably kind of a superfluid mod transition, but I mean, what in detail? Nobody knows. I mean, I mean of course, at least then, I mean, gross is is, 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 is is gone. So let me conclude, sorry. So, I mean, I've hopefully uh, given the recent uh, uh, understandable arguments for why sort of ground sets of bosons with a homogeneous density have this uh, superfluidity always, uh, as long as you keep sort of, there's no breaking of time reversal invariance or translation invariance. And then you get super solids in the way of mass density waves in these trapped superfluid gases. The transition to this modulation in density is generically a first order transition, uh, which preempts this photon instability. And finally, if you have a, such a super solid, you get defects propagating not diffusively, but in a wave like fraction, which is a bit like second sound if you have a zero temperature, where sort of in a way the motion, the role of the normal fluid is taken by sort of the motion of the lattice. Okay, so thank you for your patience and thank you for your attention. Can you yep. elaborate more how you expect the shape of the EC will change your result? Uh, I, uh, can you elaborate more? Uh, how would you expect the shape of the BEC will uh, change your result? As what you uh, mentioned. How would I expect? The cigar shape of things. That's yeah, like, like the pancake shape or the cigar shape. Or, uh, well, it, it, I mean, the, the, the fact that things depend on the shape, I mean, it is, uh, I mean, on the experimental level, clear already from the fact that you see sort of this liquid transition, there was this factor F of uh, uh, so the uh, effective interaction was G times uh, one minus epsilon dd times this F of kappa that I didn't, and this kappa uh, is the uh, ratio of the bit uh, of the gas uh, sort of along the uh, direction where that was oriented towards uh, 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 with respect to that perpendicular to it. And so experimentally in this liquid uh, story, this was about uh, uh, 0.2, which means that uh, the in a way, this was an elongated configuration where sort of the yeah. bit of the, it's like a spheroid, whether it's oblate or prolate. Uh, and in this configuration, then, I mean, you have more head to tail interactions than uh, sort of in a way repulsive things. And then you get sort of this liquid story. If if you make your kappa, uh, if, if, if it's the other way around, then, I mean, you, you, you have more repulsive than thing, and then you get, you go from sort of a gas to to a uh, uh, to this uh, sort of super solid. So you see, in, in a way, the thermodynamics extremely crucially depends on. I mean, how how you how you confine your system, and what what I mean, but what is missing at the moment is basically sort of this is done at sort of in a way at 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 the, at the, at the lowest level, but in a way to really determine then I mean the nature of the transition and what's happening, and one needs to in a way calculate the zero point energy. So this is. Uh, no, basically a question about is one able to calculate the zero point energy of such a trapped dipolar gas with these long range interactions uh, depending on, on on the shape and that's that's not a trivial problem uh, it hasn't been done people ignore somehow this question when you make the droplets epsilon doesn't have to stay the same direction it can it can it can follow the shape of the droplet. It can be different in different places. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the epsilon. Uh, is, isn't that just determined uh, by the direction of the average well, direction of the dipoles? No, no, no. The, the, the dipoles are always, uh, the, the, I mean, I always fix them into the C direction. What I, what I. Do they have to be? Yeah, well, no, they, they, that's, I mean, of course, like, I mean, you, you could, I mean, more consider more complicated yeah. calculate, calculate, uh, configurations where you say, I mean, the dipoles are not all oriented. That's something that I think so far nobody has uh, looked at. I mean, that's okay. 
Okay, but the, the droplets are aligned in the Z direction too, right? Yeah. No. Uh, I'm in, okay. I'm... Yeah, well, the, the uh, so I mean, the, 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 the configuration was such that, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just going to correction. Here, I mean, the C direction is actually sort of in a way uh, suppressed in this figure. I mean, why sort of they proper, they sort of in a way spread out in the X direction was just because sort of the confinement was taken away in this direction. I see. So it was just, uh, I mean, you just take away the confinement okay. in this direction sorry. and then they spread out there. Okay. Okay, so yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. A question about this slide actually. So in, in this effective field theory calculation is the small parameter square root of the density? Well, I mean, formally you would say it's an, it's an expansion to well, uh, next order in H bar. Uh, uh, it's not, I mean, I don't, I mean, the, 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 uh, I mean, there's no, I mean, the epsilon dd is not a small, of course, of course, it's not a small problem. You cannot, I mean, it's not, uh, I mean, I, I don't, uh, I mean, I don't see sort of, uh, I mean, see in the homogeneous uh, gas where you calculate LH by. Then you can say that the expansion parameter is square root of MAQ. But uh, that, in the end, and, and I mean, the, the dependence on density that should come out of a more proper calculation should hopefully also be of this, or uh, I mean, such give rise to a density to a coupling which, which uh, increases certainly higher than in density than sort of the mean field term. So you can say it's also it's it's a, it's a, it's an expansion in, in density. That's, true. but in a way the, the 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 usual argument that LH ray is just sort of in a way the next term in square root NA cubed. I don't think will 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 hold here. And I I'm I'm not sure sort of actually sort of I mean we have done. I mean there's one system where we have uh, calculated some effectively something like. The corrections to mean field uh, in a dipolar gas, but that was strictly 2D. And then actually the effect is so you get a correction that uh, varies. So the uh, sorry, strictly 2D, there is something like an epsilon, I call it also LHY, but so. But this goes actually LD, and then there's uh, yeah, that, uh, so it's, it's actually linear in LD, and it goes like uh, into the five halves. Uh, so that's the the, the, uh, the effect really sort of is actually linear in L, in LD and not uh, not. Uh, so yes, as I think we're discussing this uh, homogeneous equation, and the whole uh, thing is not well, I think, understood. I mean, what's what's uh, how how to how to do it? Uh, yeah, this, I mean, it's, it's a bit. I mean, dipolar interactions are super long range. I have a comment. So there's an actually another another type of experiment you can also create a road type of dispersion. And, and then see the kind of spatial structure okay, in the BEC and, uh, based on kind of okay engineering. Yeah. Uh, you mean the uh, R is correct? Uh, you had one, uh, a, a rotom, but did you see a, a, a spatial yes. modulation? Yes, ah, yeah, okay. yeah. So then the I. structure does it even before the, the dipolar gas work. Okay, so <laughs> I apologize. Uh, uh, that's true. I mean, I actually remember you giving a talk at FEQ yes. about this rotons, and I, I remember that, but I did not remember that you also yeah, I mean, see, see the density structure. modulation. They didn't see there's a universal okay. scale. Gotcha. Sorry, yeah. Okay, so this is yeah. Yeah. so it, there's a different. I mean, so the, the rotons are in that case uh, created in a very different manner, but you yeah. it yeah. also leads to some. Okay. Yeah. Interesting story. Okay.
Yeah, like, yeah, 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 y